for fresh dry curls under around the wing tip onto the lower pressure on top of the wing and forms these tornadoes coming off the wing tips. This is a pretty serious problem. I found a couple examples of small planes getting too close to big planes and being structurally destroyed in flight. It can be a control problem for big planes. In 1969, a DC-9 was flipped and lost control and crash, uh, flying two and a quarter miles behind a DC-10. So they lengthened the separation distance and this, this is what limits uh, throughput on large airports. They can only take off so fast uh, to allow the separation between these uh, wingtip tornadoes. And this is a NASA video of actual test. And I used to talk about this crash accident quite a, quite a bit. It certainly qualifies as a dramatic photograph. Believe it or not, the plane landed safely with a 14 foot by 18 foot blast hole. Everybody survived because they had their seatbelt on except one unfortunate flight attendant standing near the blast hole. Uh, the other flight attendants were fine. More recently, uh, there's been an incident of a passenger sucked out of a window. The issue is explosive decompression. Uh, pressurized gas is, is very dangerous. It's exactly analogous to st sticking a pin in a balloon and having it pop, releasing the energy suddenly. So it's a metal fatigue problem. The fatigue crack grows until it reaches critical length. And suddenly the whole rips apart and there has been earlier incidences where other, well, as recently as 2002, a 747 uh, broke up in the four pieces at 30,000 feet because of the same problem. This also gives some insight into uh, bomb damage. The fuselage is a highly redundant structure and can tolerate a lot of damage. Now, obviously this event is far beyond, beyond any rational design Concepts and they're very fortunate it, it survived. But I found that nearly half of uh, bombed planes, planes bombed in flight, actually survived the bombing and managed to safely land. Of course, nowadays, uh, professional terrorists probably have engineers on their staff. So this accident did, did set new fatigue design standards. They discovered overlooked uh, a lot of micro fatigue cracks lining up on the same row of rivets. And uh, all planes will eventually fall out of the sky with uh, takeoff and landing cycles. You pressurize up to full pressure, the wings get a full loading and they'll eventually grow fatigue cracks catastrophically. It's considered a solved engineering problem but there still can be human error in the design, the fabrication, uh, maintenance, and inspection. One of the first things I like to stress is uh, just how survivable airplane crashes are. Everyone assumes everyone dies, and that's simply not the typical crash. Uh, we can do a quick survey of the 446 wide body DC 10s made. It's a big plane, a little bit smaller than a Boeing 747, and 27 were destroyed in crashes. But only four had total loss of life. A terrorist bomb, one flew into a mountain, which had pilot air, and there are only two engineering mechanical failures. So the remaining 23, 85% of the time, 90% of the passengers survived, which is uh, pretty amazing. So. Uh, instructions they give you to keep your seatbelt on and get in the brace position are in fact very, very meaningful. So you can always impact hard enough to kill everyone. That's just not the usual scenario. Uh, they typically crash during takeoff or landing at so slower speeds closer to the ground. This is a typical crash. This is actually a made for TV crash an obsolete Boeing 727 
pilots parachuted out of it before the crash. Uh, obviously, you're going to have severe G loading near the fuselage rip. And if your seat's released, that's a very bad situation. But this accident is highly survivable. And I'm going to use this as an explanation why it's highly survivable. Since this plane broke into, had two fuselage breaks, I'm going to claim it actually struck the ground harder than the video. And we had reasonably good outputs with this accident. This is perhaps the most severe, mostly survivable, well-documented accident I'm aware of, of a DC-10 in 1989. They had an uncontained failure. A 100-pound piece of engine came flying out of the tail section and wiped out all hydraulic controls. There's three different hydraulic systems for redundancy and safety. It's one of the few places on the plane where all three of them are close together. They're separate on purpose for this very reason. So when they lose all hydraulics, they lost all control over all the flight surfaces, ailerons, rudder, elevators. They had limited partial control by altering engine thrust. So it's a very severe impact plane broke into three pieces before bursting in the flames, and 75% of the people survived the impact. Two-thirds survived, survived the impact and fire, including a baby placed on the floor as instructed. Uh, last time I looked, that's still the safety procedure for babies. Recently, they came out with a baby seat. Uh, it's just a a baby chair adapted to connect to the seat belt. But if a parent chooses to use that, they have to pay for an extra ticket. You're still allowed to carry a baby in your arms for free onto a big jet. So here's the ground scar from this impact. And we have a video. It's a pretty amazing video. So again, very severe impact planes cartwheeling before it bursts in the fireball. And it's a serious tragedy, but I'm calling it mostly survivable, which is pretty remarkable. This is also a metal fatigue problem. Uh, you could look at the inertial loading at 3,600 RPM. And I think I decided on a 100 pound piece, it's F equal MIA with about a million pounds of force. So that thing's essentially, uh, nothing's going to stop it. It's ripping through sheet metal, doing whatever it wants to do. Now, engines are designed to, re if a blade is released, to contain it. So that's uh, known as a contained failure. And this would be an uncontained failure, which has great potential to damage the plane or injure the passengers. Having said that, if it just flies off randomly into space, the most likely outcome is nothing. It has to be carefully aimed to do damage or hurt people. Now, these things are designed for metal fatigue, which again is takeoff and landing cycles. It's also designed for uh, burst, which is a one-time overload. They, they actually test them. They'll spin them till they burst. It's part of the design certification testing. So what happened here was a casting defect during manufacturing. And uh, a jet engine is a very delicate Swiss watch. It sucks in massive amounts of air. So it's not hard for it to suck, suck in a few bits of gravel and do damage. So they're frequently taken apart for minor damage. And the rules are inspect uh, for metal fatigue every time you take it apart. So this is the schedule of inspections. And it was inspected the 760 cycles before the actual failure. And because of the forensic examination, they're pretty sure the growing fatigue crack was about a half inch long and about two tenths of an inch deep. 
at the last inspection, it should have been found by the inspector, but it wasn't. And just 760 more cycles, it grew from a half inch by two tenths of an inch to a inch and a quarter inch long and about a half inch deep, and it just all flew apart, which is predictable with highly high statistical variation with fracture mechanics, which became part of a new design criteria. So General Electric, this is a GE engine, predicted 34,000 cycles of fatigue life. And of course, there's tremendous statistical scatter and fatigue life. So the FAA procedure is to certify it by 54,000 divided by three equal 18,000 cycles. And then we had the failure after 15,000 cycles. So they don't call this a safety factor, they call it a scatter factor recognizing the tremendous scatter and fatigue. George, uh, I have a question, uh, if you don't mind me. Uh, so uh, one of the attendees asked that question. So uh, beside the number of cycles, uh, isn't there also a time schedule for those inspections as well as uh, the levels of this inspections that have been done? No, there's a time schedule for inspection of the fuselage. They'll take it completely out of service, rip off all the upholstery and strip off the paint to do a detailed inspection for metal fatigue, but they don't do it for engines because engines are normally inspected a lot because of the minor damage that occurs as they suck in debris. I showed you the inspection schedule. So instead of forcing them on a rigid schedule, the rule is inspected in detail every time you take it apart for a normal service, which happens frequently. Okay. Uh, thanks. You know, I, I don't know how the timing of this is going to work out. You might say uh, questions for the end. And uh, if we don't have enough time for questions, I can respond to them additionally by other means. But anyhow. I want to point out, you, you can't find fatigue data anywhere. Uh, an axle breaks in a car and kills five people. The family collects a ton of money, but part of the settlement is a gag order. They're not allowed to talk about anything. Companies don't want bad publicity about their failures. So there's essentially no fatigue data available anywhere, but it's in these uh, crash reports, if it applies. So they did develop an entirely new design procedure. Remember I said it's designed for metal fatigue, which take off landing cycles and one time burst, but they also develop a new probabilistic design. Uh, they have studied the probability of creating a casting defect, a probability of defect passing uh, repeat, repeated inspections, They'll inspect the entire ingot, then they'll cut it up into blanks. They'll inspect that, then they'll machine it, inspect it. Uh, well, they'll forge it some more first and inspect it again, then they'll machine it and inspect it again. Uh, and then they look at the stati statistics of crack growth and fracture, which is based on fracture mechanics. So the new Criteria is using all those statistical methods is one failure per billion flights, which is, we can't make sense out of one out of a billion, but we can make sense out of, maybe there's a one out of a thousand of uh, creating a casting defect, one out of a thousand of it surviving inspections, and one out of a thousand of this, which uh, all three are in series have to occur. That would be one out of a billion, for example, as a simple illustration. And uh, this helped me understand these uh, probabilistic design methods. Usually fatigue design is based on test data. You test entire engines or you test critical components. Maybe you test uh, 50 or 100 or 200, whatever. If you did that, you conclude there's no problem. The problem's so rare, you have a hard time finding it. So, uh, however, with tens of millions of flights, you got a whole different set of statistics, you will find the problem. So normal fatigue methods cannot find the problem. Uh, so millions and millions of flights find the problem. So they had to invent a whole new design method. 
And I'd like to briefly mention this miracle crash with L-1011 crashed in the Everglades. Everglades. L-1011 is another wide body plane, almost as big as a 747. Normally when you crash an airplane, you go to a crash site and see the fuselage. Like there's the plane, maybe it's broken in two or three pieces, but you can normally recognize the fuselage. In this case, there was no recognizable circular cross section Instead, everything was scattered over a rather big debris field, 300 by 1,600 feet. And it was judged non-survivable. And that's actually significant. If a plane crash is just survivable, it triggers an entirely different type of investigation. For example, they'll study the structure of the seats and the floor. How well did it protect the passengers? This is important data can't crash a plane with live people on very often. So they study it as important engineering data. So this one was judged non-survivable. The only problem is uh, 77 people survived. Now, no one really knows or cares how that happens. There's nothing to be gained by studying a plane this fragmented. It's just a, a freak occurrence. Now, I guess I have to say something about the 737 MAX. I, I don't really want to because there's no final resolution. And this is a massive computer piloting problem. Now, you got to remember the computer software is extremely proprietary. Even if we could make sense out of it, you can't really get all the information you need. Government investigators have full access to everything, but uh, they also uh, honor the proprietary nature of the design product. Now, I'm trying to provide engineering insight for educational purposes. It's, uh, I can't really, I'm not a pilot, I'm not a software geek, so I can't really provide that sort of insight anyhow, even if we had the information. Uh, I'd like to explain this a little bit. Small planes are relatively simple. You only got three control surfaces going on. An angle of attack and thrust becomes uh, additional variables. Uh, but we could figure out what's going on relatively quickly. I don't want to minimize the skill of learning how to fly a plane. You're not going to do that in a day or two. But we could understand the science from an engineering point of view pretty easily. These big jets are incredibly complicated. There's three ways to fly the plane. First two are pretty obvious. The third way, multiple software selections. That's a phrase I coined and I got my uh, co-author, Captain, to agree with that. It's, uh, there's many, many complicated things going on. Here's a modern digital cockpit compared to an older analog cockpit. The whole point of digitizing all this information, which is not easy, is you want to stuff it into a computer and manipulate it, enforce safety rules, monitor more information and systems. So every generation of plane, they add more sen sensors, and the software keeps getting more and more complicated. It's kind of beyond human comprehension in the sense you really need a team of engineers to make sense out of this. Now, with respect to 737 MAX, there's all these systems and subsystems and components and control systems, et cetera, et cetera. We could spend hours trying to understand it, but we still wouldn't access anything. Even if we thought we understood it, complicated, subtle interactions going on in uh, the equipment and, and in the software, which is, it takes a career to sort this out. And we still need to understand it like a pilot. So to do that, we'd have to fly the plane thousands of hours. So my point is, it's a very, flying a big jet is a very complicated thing. And 
can't do justice to the 737 max problems because it's a uh, involves this very involved software and piloting issues. Now, without a doubt, increased computerization has increased safety. And computers have never caused the crash, but uh, they've added to the confusion in a few crashes. And that's part of the story here with the 737 MAX, but it also has a design issues which aren't supposed to happen. Now, for many years now, there's been a general concern. Uh, is there too much computerization? Have the pilots forgot how to fly because of all this computerization? Now, again, this is a very profound debate among pilots. You can maybe look over their shoulders, but I'm not sure we're involved, uh, we're entitled to an opinion. Now there are pilots or real engineers, you gotta have a big overlap there to sort this out, but it's very, very complicated. Now, there is a common thread that often happens. And I'm gonna talk about a specific accident. What happens is the autopilot shuts off for a variety of ordinary reasons. And if you combine that with confused pilots, which are supposed to be rare, you end up with loss of control. And that's part of the 737 MAX story, but again, it has additional design errors, which make it unique and worse and awful from an engineering point of view. My theory, if confused, if the pilots are confused and they start thinking there's a computer glitch, Computers become a confusion magnifier. Who, who hasn't been overwhelmed by computer problems? They can't make any sense out of it. So here's an example. Now this plane does illustrate this problem. In fact, it started with a faulty sensor reading, you know, shut down the autopilots, and for whatever reason, the pilots are confused. And just four and a half minutes after the autopilot shut off, this is uh, the, what the debris field at the bottom of the ocean looks like after impact at about 180 feet per second. There's just 3% uh, floating on the surface, just bits and pieces of plastic, which possibly relates to that missing plane in the sense that uh, they can't find it because there's nothing to find. Problem was frozen pitot tubes, which the pilots didn't understand at the time. So the computer's flying the plane, but it can't fly the plane without knowing the airspeed. So the autopilot shuts off with an alarm, basically says, Mr. Pilot, take over. And worse still, it was an intermittent problem adding to the confusion. So the pitot tubes are freezing. Why can't they just add a bigger heater? Well, it's not that simple. If you're designing an airplane from scratch, you micromanage the drag and power usage. So uh, if you add a bigger heater, you're going to have more drag and more power use, more electrical power use. So when they place the order, it comes out with rigid limits on the design spec for drag power, so they just can't increase the heater a lot. It's certainly part of what's being juggled in the design by the pitot tube manufacturer, but there's severe limits on making a bigger heater. Now, why are pitot tubes freezing at all? It's like, how long have we been flying planes in icing conditions, 60, 70 years? Well, and this is a big, insight into real engineering problems versus uh, the limitations of kind of how you do things in school. Well, it turns out there's too many variables that make sense out of this. Besides uh, speed, altitude, and temperature, uh, mist, rain, sleet, snow, hail, ice, these are all very different things. Uh, can't even get repeatability in the rain. 
What's the particle size and distribution? What's the water content? It, it varies a lot. Mist is totally different than rain. Supercooled water is another random wild card. It's actually water that exists below the freezing temperature. And because of that, it freezes on contact, which has some unique and complicated physics associated with it, which is what occurs in an ice storm when we see those branches encased in uh, ice. That's uh, super cool water striking the branches and freezing instantly. And snow, again, uh, what's the water content of snow? It, it varies a lot. Ice is not repeatable. You got all these different crystalline formations. So they do obviously extensive testing for icing with uh, test flights and in a wind tunnel. But the problem is after extensive testing, how do they know if they got the worst combination of circumstances? They don't know. How do you, how do you identify worst among dozens and dozens of variables? So that's a problem. Now I'm going to begin this story in 1932. We're talking about that Airbus fell out of the sky four and a half minutes after the autopilot shut off. The Army Air Corps in 1932 did a survey of experienced pilots and they concluded 90 percent of them could not maintain straight and horizontal uh, flight if they were flying in the cloud and couldn't see the horizon so they invented the horizontal horizon back then to give the guy uh, pilot got well something to look at instead of the horizon now uh, this uh air france flight uh, crashed. It was a dark and stormy night. It's often a, a factor. They couldn't see the horizon. And simple physics of a coordinated turn is interesting. And the whole, it links the spatial disorientation. If uh, you're flying a turn, the inertial loading vectorally adds to the wake loading. And the vector sum goes right through your spine. If you drive through a turn, there's a sideways shove. Well, you turn in a plane, there is no sideways shove. It's very difficult to notice you're turning. In fact, if you put a glass of water on a tray in front of you, the water level will remain level. It doesn't tilt because the vector sum is going straight through the Access is a glass of water. So that's part of the confusion. Uh, you can't tell you're turning, and if you can't see the horizon and it's a dark and stormy night, well, you got a problem. And in this particular case, uh, the pitot tubes are freezing and unfreezing. So the stall alarms were intermittent going on and off adds to the confusion, basically don't trust anything. So again, I think it's a, they're thinking computer glitch and it becomes a confusion multiplier. And it also, uh, the, valid, the air speeds drift in and out between valid and totally false. So they got serious control inputs. You can't make any sense out of, neither can the autopilot computer make any sense out of it. So the confused pilot oversteers the plane. I think it's the same thing. I, I imagine driving and your steering suddenly stops working. You, you'd oversteer back and forth trying to get a response that you can understand. So the pilot rapidly changes from a aggressive climb and roll to a dive and stall. Another unusual thing about a stall, it's the angle of attack relative to the direction of flight. So if you're in a dive and you're stalling because your angle of attack is too high, you need to lower the nose, which is a scary thought. It puts it deeper in the dive. It totally defies common sense. However, pilots are supposed to understand this and highly trained for this. But be that as it may, they had enough information to fly the plane straight level flight. They had an artificial horizon.
So all they had to do was pay attention to artificial horizon. They could have flew the plane. But these guys are totally baffled. And you can get that out. There's some conversation that was uh, recorded. And the record, a cockpit voice recorder, also uh, recorded stall buffeting. When you begin to stall, you have very turbulent air coming off the wing, which uh, will vibrate the elevators and the tail horizontal stabilizer and shake the controls. So this is kind of a fundamental feel for flying the airplane. The controls start to shake in this cating stall. Now, so they're the cockpit voice recorder recorded stall buffeting and noise, and they never considered stall. They actually thought about high speed stall, high speed buffeting, which is a totally different mechanism. I don't know why they shouldn't have, th they should have thought of stall first, but whatever reason they didn't. So they got the ang angle of attack up to 35 degrees, which is uh, it's probably stalling around 20 degrees. Or starting the stall. And you can actually see this laminar versus turbulent. You can play with a faucet. You turn it on low flow. It's very quiet. It's transparent. You can see through it. You increase the flow rate. It gets noisy. And the chaotic motion uh, turns the stream uh, transparent. Boeing and Airbus approaches this problem totally differently. Boeing has a stick shaker, which artificially creates the stall buffet. The computer decides the one to shake the stick, which is a warning to the pilots when, uh, when Boeing decides that's the proper time to warn them based on conditions. Airbus does not have a stick shaker. Uh, their autopilot is supposed to prevent them from stalling. The pilot cannot give input controls that'll stall the plane because the autopilot and computer uh, guards against that. The Boeing planes do not. The pilot can accidentally stall the plane, but he gets a warning with this uh, stick shaker. However, this Airbus uh, computer preventing stalling, it doesn't work. The computer doesn't know what the airspeed is. So remember, the computer shut off because there were false airspeeds. And another curious thing that's interesting, uh, you learn how to fly a small plane. You actually practice stalling as part of your experience. So you know what it's like, you know how to recover. Well, big plane pilots, do not practice stalls. It's not considered safe. In fact, uh, the history of large commercial jets in the late 50s, early 60s, they were killing pilots in training flights, trying to practice things that almost never occurred. And the simulators got better and better and better, and they just backed off on these uh, dangerous maneuvers. So what they actually practice in the simulator is flying up to when the stall alarm goes off. So the official uh, conclusion for this Air France flight that crashed, no explanation why the pilots couldn't maintain straight and level flight. That's what they said. But remember, you can't do it as you can see the horizon, 90% of pilots can't maintain straight level flight without seeing the horizon, but they did have an artificial horizon guidance. So again, uh, I think they're start, as soon as they think computer glitch, they're overwhelmed and don't know what to think, can't trust anything. Ice is a big problem in engines and wings. And because of this accident, they did new fundamental research, and there's new FAA rules on icing because of the fundamental research. But who's to say they got the worst combination of circumstances figured out now? Not all you can say it's better. 
Incidentally, I'd like to point out a plane gets out of position, falls out of the sky and kills 300 people. Computational fluid dynamics adds absolutely nothing. They don't even attempt to study the problem with CFD. The entire thrust of the investigation is why did the plane get out of position? There's no attempt to study what the pilot could do once it's out of position. There, there's no information. There's, there's no, the CFD is not good enough to s deal with this transient uh, situation. And this is an interesting video uh, that saw, uh, illustrates the problem. The CFD is not very good at stalling. It can't model this. It's kind of a very random motion. And uh, that's actually kind of a bit of an ideal situation. So, well, I'll get to that in a second. So the pa FAA passed a new rule in 2014. We're going to update all the simulators to fly deeper in the stall by 2019. This is a very massive, massive engineering problem. You have to collect the data on what it means to stall and stuff it into the simulators and certify the simulator based on test pilots that don't exist, the test pilots that can say this is a, a correct simulation of really stalling. So it's a massive, massive F engineering effort, a combination of test testing and uh, CFD. And as part of this effort, a couple of Boeing test pilots stalled the 737 over 700 times uh, to support the new rule. NASA took a different approach and decided uh, they could uh, simulate these stalls with uh, wind tunnel tests and CFD. The CFD could not do it by itself. I'd also like to mention when they do stall testing, pilots wear parachutes. So the five-year deadline passes and nothing happens. This can be considered a failure of CFD, just not up to the tax. They're, they're very happy with CFD design for a steady state. CFD transient is extremely iffy. And basically, it's an airflow problem. We can do steady state airflow. They can't do transient airflow, which uh, incidentally is the same science. It's all the same science airflow, whether it's designing an airplane, a weather simulation, or a client, climate simulation. Now, the FAA defines an upset as a 25 degree nose up or 10 degree nose down or a 45 degree roll. Pilots are taught to never, well, this is not normal flight. Pilots are taught to never roll the wings more than 30 degrees, for example. But it's far more complicated. When you say, let's study stalling, What's the orientation of the plane? You got three axes of rotation, so you got infinitely many potential orientations. I don't really know for sure, but I suspect this was a severe limit on their ability to sort this out with CFD. Because when you say stall, I showed you the video of a sort of a steady state stall. There's one orientation of the plane. There's only one variable occurring. They increase the angle of attack so you get a very random turbulent motion. But the real upset conditions are far more complicated. So stall, define stalls. What's the orientation? This is uh, an abrupt end. Uh, all your decompressions be slow. It's an old Irish toast. And I'd like to address any t questions if you have any at this point. Are there any questions? Uh, can you hear me, George? This is Mason. 
Yes. Okay, thank you so much, George. An excellent, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. A quick question. What if, uh, whatever you mentioned, uh, what if it happens in a transoceanic flight? I heard what if in a something something flight. I didn't hear the something something. Did you hear me? I missed the key word. Oh, can you talk about fighter plane stalls? Well, I don't know if that's a question. I don't know if you can hear me. But uh, basically, a fighter plane is a Formula One race car, and a large commercial jet is a school bus. They're all designed, they're both designed for inertial loads. Uh, for example, the wings are designed for. Uh, turn of 2.5 G's with the 1.5 safety factor. A fighter plane might be designed for eight or nine G's. And actually it's a state secret. The limit is the human body and it's a, it's a military secret. Any other questions? So I, hi, uh, George. Thank you uh, for the very interesting presentation. So. I'm asking everyone uh, to basically type their questions and I'm going that with order. If you have a follow-up question, we can do that. And if you're not really satisfied, you can ask me to unmute you. So um, um, first thing is that, uh, can you hear me good enough, George and everyone else? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So we have a um, question from uh, Shirshak, if I pronounce this correctly. Uh, he says that, uh, do you have any insight on the Malaysian pl plane disappearance? Yes. Uh, the, anyone familiar with airplane crashes knows it was a criminal act. Uh, the problem is uh, the official investigators will not announce anything without hard facts. In the absence of odd, uh, hard facts, they said nothing, which kind of added to the mystery. There are other things can, that can explain what happened, like a fire or a hypoxic flight crew passing out, but uh, they are pretty certain the plane was steered repeatedly and shut down multiple safety systems. So you can't really explain that easily. A fire could shut down multiple safety systems, but if you're on fire, the first thing you do is uh, your radio air traffic control and say, I'm on fire, find me a place to land immediately. Even if you're going down in the ocean, that is a very survivable event. The plane goes in the ocean under pilot control, there will be survivors. High speeds crash, not so much. So if you go down the ocean, your radio, here I am, come and get me. So uh, you can't explain all the events, known events without a criminal action. Um, um, the next question, you mentioned the fighter planes one. I'm going to move to the next person. Dr. Hefsi asked a question. Um, so you mentioned, George, that the survival rate is high. Uh, uh, however, many recent accidents, uh, they have no survival. Uh, can you um, comment on that? Well, uh, there are far more accidents during landing and takeoff, that if they happen around the world, they don't necessarily get a lot of publicity. They'll get reported on, but they'll come and disappear in a big deal, in a big hurry. Uh, you kill everyone, it gets 10 times the publicity. And this, this Boeing situation is really bad. To find something analogous, you have to go back 50 years to Haviland Comet, uh, it's a, hopefully it's a gross anomaly. Thank you. So the next question is from Reddy Kappa. Um, and I'm sorry, guys, if I don't pronounce your names correctly, it's very small here. Um, so the question um, is that are black boxes traceable? 
What do you mean by traceable? Oh, well, they, they ping for 90 days, the FAA rules. Uh, but you have to get, if you're the 20,000 feet down in the bottom of the ocean, you have to get close enough to find them. So if you have no idea where the plane is, which is a problem with uh, the missing Malaysian plane, plane I just talked about, Air France, they had it narrowed down to a 60 mile radius circle and they still almost failed to find it. Uh, so they were, there was a signal coming every 10 minutes that helped locate the plane. But the Malaysian plane, it was kind of a partial signal coming every hour. It wasn't really, the signal wasn't designed to locate the plane. It's basically talking to the network saying, I'm still here, keep listening to me. Um, I have a follow-up question. So why they can't just simply put some GPS tracker so that they can find it where, wherever it is? Uh... Well, that's a funny thing. Uh, a lot of the first world countries, they're flying hundreds of flights a day. They do extensive tracking, not for safety. And also you got to remember, like the Air France and the Malaysian plane, uh, if you actually knew the location quickly, it wouldn't have saved the plane. They're, everybody's still dead. It's really not much of a safety issue. It just helps the investigation. Uh, but they do extensive uh, tracking information because uh, delays cost them money. So they keep track of everything closely to figure it out. So a brand new plane in a third world country, they're only flying one flight a day. It might come with a lot of these uh, communication systems, but you got to spend extra money to turn them on. It's like essentially paying for an internet connection and you got to pay extra money for extra training. So they may not even turn them around, it's, turn them on. That, there's, there's many problems. Uh, so you got different airlines doing different things it's hard to agree to a universal system. You can't just impose these things on other countries very easily. There's, there's other reasons, like there's satellite trackers, and there's two totally incompatible systems. One has satellites in geosynchronous orbits at about 23,000 feet high, so they sit there in the same, they rotate with the Earth, and you can always find them. The other one has a lower Earth orbit, and they orbit every 90 minutes. The synchronous orbits every 24 hours. Well, they're totally incompatible systems. To talk to the synchronous system, you need a much more powerful transmitter to transmit 24,000 miles. The one that tracks every, orbits every 90 minutes, you need a more complicated tracking system to keep track of all these uh, satellites in and out of the, your airspace. So I, I haven't looked at this for a couple of years. They've been making a lot of problem uh, progress, but uh, there's this what appears to be common sense creates all kinds of goofy problems. Thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, from Maharashi Patel, uh, and he's asking about the Concorde. So uh, Concorde reported many crashes and uh, they eventually got banned. So uh, he's basically asking uh, your insights uh, and anything you might uh, want to say about that. Well, when I do a, a more involved lecture on that explosive decompression, I always talk about the De Havilland Comet. They kind of invented the problem at that time. They tried to ignore metal fatigue. They thought if they designed it for an overpressurization or a higher pressure, that would be adequate for metal fatigue and it wasn't. And kind of even worse, they, they took a section of fuselage and cycled it in pressure cycles 10,000 times before it started to grow a fatigue crack. But uh, it was an invalid test. Before they did that, they did a proof testing to uh, 16 PSIG. Uh, 
standard pressure design is about an eight pound differential. The internal pressure is eight pounds, eight pounds pressure greater than the outside. And they thought if they designed it for 16, they can ignore metal fatigue. But when they tested the 16 before during the pressure cycle, they ended up uh, creating compressive residual stresses that enhanced the fatigue life. It's, I could easily explain this if I do a number of diagrams, but it's uh, probably a 15 minute lecture. So uh, they, they thought they had a good fatigue design. They mostly ignored it and they didn't. So they, they had, I think, about three planes that fell apart rapidly due to explosive decompression. And they also invented, uh, the first time they fatigue tested an entire plane uh, on the ground for uh, to study the problem. But yes, that was a problem. And Boeing came out with the 707 shortly after that, and they had the benefit of uh, the Havilland Comet's experience and had to address metal fatigue. There's a lot more that could be said about that of an engineering nature. So do you think that, uh, again, one day we will have supersonic uh, passenger uh, airplane that you can basically uh, cross the ocean in a few hours? Well, there's a couple problems with that. Uh, the con oh, are we, are we talking about the Concorde or the... Well, I mean, yeah, Concorde was a failure, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm any... sorry, I was talking about the Comet. 1950s. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, well, there's a couple problems with the Concorde. It, it takes tremendous amounts of energy. I don't know if there's a simple solution to that. And also the sonic boom is a problem. I think they are coming up with solutions to that. I'm not sure. But uh, coincidentally, when I was growing up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the Air Force had a bomber flying over every night at 8 p.m. Uh, exerting a sonic boom to test uh, effects on a large metropolitan area. And it shook the entire house, like probably about a Richter 4 earthquake. And women would break windows occasionally, and women were having miscarriages. So based on that, the United States banned the Concorde flying across the uh, United States, the land. It could land on the coast, but they limited the flight. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going through the questions. So I think Dr. Emily, uh, he asked, well, a uh, very nice talk. Uh, uh, and then uh, he basically says that, uh, what is the level of loading and fatigue induced by wingtip uh, vortices? Is there data on stress reduction for wings uh, uh, with winglets? Well, uh, those wingtip vortices are actually a tremendous source of drag. I found one reference said 50 to 80 percent of the drag. It takes tremendous energy to create uh, two uh, tornadoes. It's kind of analogous to a ship's wake. If you slide the steel through the water, there's almost no drag. But if you churn up the big wake, that's where all the energy is dissipated. So the wind tip vortices are designed to reduce the tornadoes, and they typically increase efficiency by maybe three to five percent, something like that. They're not a safety feature; it's an efficiency feature. Thank you. Um... I have, um, I don't know if it's a question or a follow-up comment by uh, Patel. Uh, so there is a, a there is ELT emergency locator uh, transmitter for accurate location information and tracking. Um, any comment on that? I don't know what ELT means. Uh, me either. Uh, so um, I can basically uh, try to find that out. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'd like to thank you again. Very, very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, I want to see if there's any other uh, basically uh, uh, person has a question or comment uh, while we basically uh, uh, think of this.
Try to um, unmute, but I don't know why it doesn't work that well. Okay. So, so uh, if, yeah, I don't know what is ELT either. So, uh, and I'm trying to, I think this feature doesn't work that I can unmute people. Uh, um, I'll switch you back to host so you can unmute people. Hold on. Uh, I'm sorry, what? I'll switch you back to host so that you are able to unmute people again. One moment. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to see. One of the students had a question. Well, um, he had a comment, uh, and I don't know what is ELT. So, uh, so I I mute you, uh, Maharashi. Uh, I guess uh, I guess it's ETL, Emergency Tracking Locator. Dr. Chuck said it. Oh, okay, Dr. Chuck. Okay. So, uh, emergency track locator for accurate location info. I don't know what is the difference of that um, emergency track locator. So probably it's. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not familiar ETL. with that phrase either. ETL, yeah, emergency tracking locator, and I don't know what is that, but I'm just always wondering uh, what would be the difference of that with uh, a simple uh, GPS system uh, that basically can do the same. Think. So I muted uh, a couple of parties, Dr. Chalk and Pedal, if they have follow up comments or questions on that topic. Uh, we can basically provide that. Okay. Uh, uh, Sam, you had a question, I remember. Yeah, I guess uh, I had a question and of course a second thank you. Let me start with the thank you, George. A very great talk. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And as I told you before, once our life is back to normal, I would like you to come on campus next fall and provide this talk because it it's worth hearing it for a second time. I really enjoyed it and I would like students to get even involved more. Therefore, we plan to, to meet you again sometime next fall in fall 2020 for an on-campus topic. This is a thank you and a quick suggestion. Uh, my question was here, which I was disconnected. What if, uh, and I'm not quite sure if you answered it or not, because I was not there. What if uh, this stalling or other issues happens in a trans-oceanic flight? What if, what's, I didn't so, hear uh, whatever, whatever, let's say this fatigue or, uh, stalling happens in a transoceanic flight on a, on flights over oceans because there is no chance for an emergency landing. Well, an stall uh, is a crash situation. Does that answer your question? Beside beside the stalling, let's say a fatigue issue. Would, would it be like a catastrophic failure and like hundred percent? Fatality if it happens in a transoceanic flight? No, uh, standard Boeing design practice is 95% uh, reliability for fatigue after 30 years. Now, does that mean 5% of the planes are destroyed in flight? No, what it means is uh, there'll be uh, ordinary fatigue cracks that can be found during normal inspection you're supposed to understand how fast the cracks are growing and when they reach critical lengths and inspect a lot more often. Now, having said that, uh, you're actually designed. Uh, the rules are you cannot fly a plane with any cracks. In fact, they, FAA fined US Air a few years ago for fly, flying with uh, fatigue cracks of a few inches. But the design parameter, the fuselage is supposed to be safe and stable with a 40 inch crack. So that's your safety margin. Uh, no cracks are allowed. And if you happen to have one, it can, it can be up to 40 inches. It's supposed to be structurally safe. In fact, I found an example of a DC-9 flying with a 39-inch crack, and nobody knew it was there until they did the detailed fatigue inspection. So uh, they, and like I said, all planes will fall out of the sky if you just keep cycling them. Uh, but it's they know how to prevent it, but bad things still happen accidentally. There's humans in the loop. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please uh, mute? Uh, uh, so thanks again, uh, Dr. Bible. Uh, uh, it was a very um, uh, interesting talk and it was an interesting experience for the, for us. The first time we were doing our graduate seminar in a virtual format. And interestingly enough, we got more questions than in person talks. So that's quite interesting thing. So I'd like to thank you again. Uh, looking forward at some point uh, to meet you. Please stay safe. Uh, and uh, the same applies to everyone else. Thanks again uh, for attending this uh, uh, basically a webinar or virtual talk. And uh, if you have any input, uh, reach out to me, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.